This evening uh, we're looking at uh, Matthew chapter 18. As I've already mentioned, uh, it's the parable of the uh, slave who was forgiven the great debts and who refused to forgive his fellow slave his debt. And what happened, uh, this is something our Lord Jesus spoke in the context of forgiveness, and it's something that we need to hear and by God's grace be able to do. Let me read it for you, beginning in verse 21 of uh, Matthew 18. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave? in the same way that I had mercy on you. And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. May the Lord help us this evening to receive uh, these words of our Lord. Now, again, I just want to remind you, we already saw the first part of this uh, this morning uh, with regard to the mercy that the Lord has shown to each one of you by sending His Son into the world and the mercy that Jesus has shown you by being willing to come and to take your place in obedience and in death so that you might enter into heaven. Now, this evening, we want to consider why it is that you should show mercy to others as well, even as the Lord has shown mercy to you. And basically, I believe this parable gives to us uh, three reasons. The first is because, certainly because of the mercy that God has shown to you. Secondly, because He commands you to show mercy to others. And thirdly, because of what He threatens if you don't show mercy to others. Now, again, I thought I would just briefly review what we saw this morning under the first point, and I think uh, we, we do see something of the same thing here. First, you should show mercy to others because of the mercy that the Lord has shown you. Now, let's consider the context of, of this particular parable. What Jesus is speaking about here really stems from a question that Peter had regarding forgiveness. Uh, hearing what Jesus said to do when someone sins, and this is the part we didn't read, uh, when he talks about uh, if your brother sins, what should you do? Well, when Jesus is speaking about this, he's speaking presumably about when he sins against you, what should you do? Although we understand that we may see somebody sinning and may still need to confront them, even if that sin isn't against us in particular. Well, Jesus said you need to go to them and you need to seek to bring them to repentance. And if they don't repent, then bring one or two more with you to try to bring them to repentance and also to have witnesses because if they don't repent after that, you bring it to the church. Again, in each of these cases, seeking to bring that person to repentance because if they don't repent of their sin, it will destroy them. Well, Peter is asking, well, what should you do if you do go to your brother who has sinned and he asks for forgiveness. 
Well, Jesus says, show mercy to them and forgive them. And then Peter, of course, wanting to learn a little bit more and perhaps uh, wanting to shine among the, the other apostles, says, well, how often should we forgive them, Lord? Uh, what if they continue to sin against you and keep coming and keep asking for forgiveness? How many times should you go through this process and forgive them? Now, Peter suggests what, to his mind, appears to be a generous helping of mercy, up to seven times. And really, when Peter was suggesting seven times, he actually more than doubled what the Jewish teachers were teaching the Jews as far as how many times they should forgive others. They said three times, but the fourth time, don't forgive them. So Peter is saying, well, Lord, how about seven times? Well, Jesus says, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Uh, in essence, what Jesus is saying is, Peter, you need to be more generous. Now, did Jesus mean when he said this that 490 times, that's the limit, you keep count, and when they reach that after that, no more forgiveness? No, but Jesus is saying that you need to forgive an unlimited number of times. As many times as your brother or sister might sin against you and then turn again and ask for your forgiveness. Now, to help them understand why it is that they should do that, Jesus tells them the story of a slave who owed his master a debt that was so great it could never be paid, who asked his Lord for mercy and this Lord granted it, but then who turned around and refused to show mercy to his fellow slave when he did the same. We do need to understand that Jesus told this parable to his disciples, but he, of course, had it written down. He preserved it and he commanded that it be preached to you so that you would understand that you are under the same obligation to forgive others and to show them mercy. Now, why should you forgive others up to 70 times 7, an unlimited number of times? Well, you should forgive them, first of all, because the Lord has forgiven you, as we saw this morning. You owed a debt to the Lord that was so large that you never could have repaid it. Remember the sin that you committed in Adam, the one that was charged to your account that made you a sinner in the first place by itself would have been enough to weigh you down into hell forever. But you've sinned many more times than that throughout your life. And also, before the Lord came to you in His grace and mercy, you had something in your heart that God counted by itself sin and enough to condemn you, and that was your hatred against God. All of these things put you into infinite debt. But the Lord forgave that debt. When you turned from your sins and trusted in His Son, it's not something that happens automatically. You must believe on the Lord Jesus. And when you did, He canceled your debt completely. He canceled your debt permanently. You no longer have to fear spending an eternity in hell to pay off that debt because the Lord has wiped your slate clean, again, as we saw this morning. Now, that's the first reason Jesus gives as to why you should be willing to forgive others and to show mercy to them because He has shown mercy to you. And of course, when we consider the, well, as we're going to in just a moment, the debt that you owed compared to the debt that others may owe to you, it's nothing in comparison. Now, secondly, you should show mercy to others because God commands you to. That's really the whole point of this parable, isn't it? To illustrate that you should forgive those who sin against you. This second slave that has this debt to the first slave really represents any brother or sister who has offended you, who has sinned against you in some way, and then turns from that and asks for your forgiveness, asks for mercy. Now, Jesus acknowledges that their sins are much less severe than the ones that you have committed against God. He, he represents the second debt as 
a hundred denarii, which is a hundred days' wages. If we put it in today's terms, I mean, what does a person earn for a day's wage? Well, I don't know, but a hundred dollars, maybe. Or if you're skilled, perhaps more than that. But a hundred times that, okay, well, that's, let's say a hundred dollars times a hundred, uh, well, we end up with, you know, a few thousand dollars. But that in comparison to 10,000 talents. Now, we're not terribly familiar with this kind of terminology, but a talent, if these talents are gold, in, by today's standards, a talent would be worth about $660,000, and you multiply that by 10,000. I'm not going to do the math, but you can see that that's quite a large number. Now, the reason why the, the debt of the second servant is smaller is because it's being considered as committed against the first servant rather than the sins committed against God. And we understand that every sin that a man commits or woman or child in this, in this world is committed against God and incurs an infinite debt, but is considered against someone else, it is comparatively very small because when we sin against one another, you know, it's not like sinning against the infinitely holy God. So our sins against Him are infinite. Our sins against one another are quite limited. And what kinds of sins are, is the, the Lord referring to here? Well, we know there's a lot of different ways that we can offend one another and sin against one another. Uh, maybe someone said something about you that wasn't true. Or maybe they're telling things about you to other people that they don't like about you. Uh, maybe you took them into your confidence and told them a secret and you made them promise never to tell, but they went out and they told other people. Maybe they took something from you. Maybe they injured you physically. Maybe they accused you falsely. Now, there's many things that people can do against you uh, to offend you and to sin against you, to injure you in some way. But when by God's grace they come to their senses and they come asking for you to forgive them and to show them mercy, what, do you, what are you supposed to do? Well, Jesus says that you should remember something. You should remember that you were indebted to God's justice and that you owed a great debt to Him, and yet He forgave you in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you should remember that on the basis of that mercy and forgiveness, that He has commanded you to be forgiving and you to be merciful, not up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven, as many times as they repent and ask for your forgiveness. The Lord was merciful to you, and so the Lord commands you to show mercy to them as well. Now, I do want you to notice that Jesus here is, is, has in view a situation where a brother or sister has committed this sin, and they, they come to you repenting, asking for your forgiveness. I think we would all agree, well, at least I hope we would, by the grace of God, that when that actually happens, it's not that difficult to forgive them when they humble themselves and seek forgiveness. Sometimes it may be difficult, depends on the, the gravity of the sin that they've committed against you. But what should you do if a brother or sister sins against you, but they don't ask for forgiveness? You see, that makes it a little bit more difficult, doesn't it? I do believe the Bible says that we won't fully be reconciled to them and have the kind of peace and resolution that we would like to have with them unless they do ask for forgiveness. But even if they don't, I think the example of our Lord Jesus Christ is that we should still be willing to forgive. We should desire reconciliation. We should resist holding any hatred or animosity against them in our hearts. And we should seek to show them kindness and we should pray for them that they might repent and seek for God's forgiveness and for your forgiveness as well. Now, what if the person who sins against you isn't even a believer? What if it's an unbeliever? Well, I believe the Lord tells us that we should still do the same. And while we're on the subject of mercy, I think we should also consider what, what should we do uh, in other cases that don't really have to do with forgiveness but still have to do with showing mercy. 
Well, the, if we see a brother or sister in need and they, asks us, they ask us for help, well, then what should we do? Well, as far as we're able, we should try to help them. Remember, our Lord has given us the resources that He has given us for a reason, and He has put His love in our hearts for a reason. And He tells us that when we see a brother or sister in need, that we need to have compassion on them and show them mercy. And we should do that even if they don't ask us for help. Sometimes we think we're not obligated because they didn't ask. Well, if they didn't ask, I'm not going to help. But Jesus tells us that we should. He says to the Apostle John in 1 John 3, verses 17 and 18, But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. The Lord would have us to love one another and to help one another as He gives us the ability to help and as He brings people into our lives who actually need that help. Now that, again, has to do with a brother or sister who is in need. What if they're not a brother or sister? What if they are not a believer? Well, I think the example of the Good Samaritan shows you that you should help those who were even outside the faith. Remember, it was a Samaritan who saw a Jew who was willing to help him. And Paul writes to the Galatians the very same thing. He says, so then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially those who are of the household of the faith. Again, the mercy of God, the command of God, puts us under the obligation to help as many people as we can. And the fact that the Samaritan and the Jew were actually enemies points to the fact that you should help even your enemies when they are in need, even as you once were God's enemy, and yet He had mercy on you. Remember, while we were still sinners, He sent His Son to die for us. While we were His enemies, you see. So as the Lord has shown you mercy... You are to show mercy to others as well. Jesus says, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. And He says that right after saying that God is, is kind even to ungrateful and evil men. So the Lord has shown you mercy. And on the basis of that, you are to show mercy. The Lord commands you to show mercy. And so you are to show mercy. But finally... You should show mercy because of what the Lord threatens if you don't. Now, remember the first slave who had his debt forgiven went and found a fellow slave who owed him a much lesser debt and refused to forgive him even though he pleaded with him the same way that he had pleaded with his master. And the first slave had the second slave thrown into prison until he should pay back every cent that was owed. Now, when his master, his Lord, found out about this, what is it that he did to him? Well, he handed him over to the torturers until he should pay back the last cents. And putting that into terms, as far as um, uh, real life, what uh, the Lord meant by that was he was not forgiven, but he ended up having to suffer for his own sins in hell forever. The Lord says if you're not willing to show mercy, if you're unwilling to forgive those who have sinned against you when they ask for forgiveness, the Lord will not forgive you, but He will require you to pay your own debt. Jesus says in verse 35, again, those words that certainly, um, I think, impacted each one of us, my heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Now, if you're wondering whether Jesus really, you know, really says what he appears to say here, don't forget that he said the same thing at the conclusion of the Lord's Prayer. Remember the Lord's Prayer, he teaches us to pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
which means either we've forgiven others, so Lord, forgive us, or Lord, forgive me in the same way that I forgive others. And then afterwards, Jesus expands on that a little bit because perhaps his disciples didn't understand that particular point. So he says in Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15, For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Now, I know that many times uh, expositors might come to this passage and say, well, we know that our forgiveness is not dependent upon our forgiving other people. So this must be referring to something that God doesn't forgive us in life, but He still takes us to heaven. Now, I think what Jesus is saying here is your transgressions, your sins will not be forgiven if you do not forgive others. Again, think about what he says in the Beatitudes, which we're going to be singing at the conclusion of the service. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. If we are not merciful, the Lord will not show mercy to us. Now, I know that sounds like salvation by works, but it isn't. And we need to understand what the Lord means by this. Is Jesus saying that if you don't forgive those who sin against you, that you won't be forgiven? Well, yes, that's what he's saying. That's what we need to come to grips with. But does he mean by this that your forgiving other people is the grounds of his forgiving you? That your forgiveness actually earns, as it were, or your forgiving others actually ends or earns your forgiveness from God? No, because if that's what it meant then you would be saved by your own mercy and not by God's mercy. What I believe the Lord means here, the only thing He can mean is this, that your willingness to forgive others their sins against you is the evidence that God has forgiven you. If you are able to forgive from the heart, if you are able to show mercy to others, then that shows you that you have received mercy because you wouldn't be able to do this except by God's grace. This ability to forgive is really a part of what it means to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That's what it means to put on the new man. It's what it means that the Lord is cleaning out the inside that the outside may be clean as well. It's what it means to become a partaker of the divine nature. That's what redemption is all about, is to transform us into the image of Christ, to become like Him. And this is exactly what Jesus was like. This is exactly what He did. Remember when He was on the cross, having been very unjustly condemned and beaten and mocked and scourged and then crucified, that He wasn't on the cross in anger, calling down curses upon the heads of those who had done this to Him but rather we find Him praying for those who had done this to Him. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus was showing mercy from the cross. The fact that He was on the cross in the first place was an infinite act of mercy towards us. And Stephen showed the same mercy as his Lord when he was praying for those who were stoning him while they were stoning him. You can imagine what that feels like. But he prays before he dies, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. He was praying for mercy, mercy for them, even though they very unjustly condemned and killed him. Now, this is a part, as I've said, of the new nature. This is the work the Spirit of God is doing in your heart. He gives you the willingness to show mercy, which means that if you can't find it in your heart to forgive as Jesus forgave or to show mercy or to show kindness as God shows even the wicked, then you need to wonder whether or not you really have trusted Jesus, whether or not Jesus Christ is being formed in you. Remember, the difference between a believer and an unbeliever can be summarized in just one thing, and that is love. Is that love there? If that love is there, it will give you the ability to be forgiving. Now, having said that, 
we need to realize this doesn't mean that showing mercy or forgiveness is always going to be easy. There is still that part of you that the Bible tells us that doesn't want to forgive, that doesn't want to show mercy, that wants to get even. That is the old man. That is the old nature. That is the corruption, that imperfection that is still in your soul, in my soul. Because redemption, though it has begun, uh, that, that new image is being formed in us. It's not perfectly formed yet, and it won't be until we get to heaven. But because it's there, it's always going to get in your way when you want to do what's right. So it's not going to be easy. But don't forget, on the other hand, that that grace that God has given to you by His Holy Spirit that produces that character of Christ in you, it is powerful enough to overcome all that sin that is still in you, which is why the Lord commands you through the Apostle Paul in Romans 8.13, by the Spirit of God to put to death the deeds of the flesh. You have the power to do that. You have the power to put on the new man. You have the power to overcome your sin. You have the power to do what's right by your spirit. And so he commands you to do that. He commands you to show mercy and to forgive, even as the Lord showed mercy to you and forgave you. Now, again, the whole point of this is, is simply this, that we're looking at those characteristics that the Lord wants to see in us. The reason why He redeemed us, so that we might advance His kingdom in this world. He's looking for those who actually are growing in this area. The more you show mercy, the more you're going to be like Jesus. And the more you're like Jesus, the more you're going to show up on God's radar when He searches the earth looking for someone to use. He's not looking for the merciless. He's looking for those who are full of mercy and who are willing to forgive and to help and to assist others, those who will be living examples of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's end this by simply asking this question, seeing that God has shown mercy to us and commands us to show mercy, and what happens if we don't show mercy? We do need to ask the question, how can you become more merciful? Well, if you don't have the image of Christ being formed in you, if there isn't that desire to forgive at all, the only thing you can do is turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, turn from your sins and believe on Him. That's the only way the image of Christ will be formed in you. You can't do it in your own strength. But what if you have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ? What should you do? You know, the answer to these questions is basically always the same. And that is, use the means of grace. Because the more you use them, the more you are going to be like Jesus Christ. The more you pray and ask God to uh, fill you with His Holy Spirit and to give you a merciful heart, the more mercy you're going to have in your heart to show to others. The more you read the Word of God and believe what is said here, you know, not only the promise that, that you are you know, by God's grace being conformed to the image of His Son, but also the threats that are in here, what the Lord will do to you if you don't show mercy to others. Faith takes those things and applies those things. It makes a difference in the way that we live. So read the Word of God and believe what it says. Spend more time worshiping the Lord because as you worship the Lord, you gain more of His Spirit. And again, as we have the opportunity to celebrate the Lord's Supper, celebrate it, come to the table, participate, receive God's grace. But also don't forget to meditate on what the Lord has done for you. There's a reason why Jesus gave this parable. He wants to remind us of what God has done, how He forgave your 10,000 talent debt when you begin to see and understand just how merciful the Lord has been to you, it won't be then so hard to forgive the one who has sinned against you 
a hundred denarii worth. Well, may the Lord help us to see His mercy. May He also remind us of the command and of the threat, and may He use these things to work within us the grace of forgiveness and mercy. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a word of prayer and silent prayer, and let's ask the Lord to help us grow in this area.